So there have been five mass extinction events over the last half billion years or so. Catastrophic events that wiped out up to 90% of the species on Earth. And scientists are currently reporting that our rate of loss and decline of animals right now is contributing to what appears to be the next mass extinction event. And so I'd like to ask you, Elizabeth, about this sixth extinction and, and how you first became aware of it and what led you really to write about the theme? Well, that's a, a, a good question. <laughs> and it, it, it has, there's a lot of strands to it. And I sort of tell the story at the, at the beginning of the book, I became um, really interested in what's become known as the amphibian crisis. I don't know if people in this, it's definitely affected Australia. You've lost some of your most really fascinating um, amphibians, frog. like the yeah. gastric brooding frogs, which were frogs that uh, brooded their young in their stomachs and gave births basically through, the, through their mouths through two species that are now gone. Um, and I became really interested in that. It seemed like just an amazing uh, sort of event that wasn't getting enough coverage. And I was looking for a way to write about it. And I actually came across a story in a kids magazine, National Geographic's Kids, about this uh, frog hotel where they had taken frogs out of the rainforest in Panama and literally put them in a hotel. Uh, and it was a very cute little kid story. And I thought, well, maybe this is a way for me to write about this, this story for adults, go down to visit the frog hotel. Um, and then very shortly thereafter, words I read a story by some herpetologists about this uh, amphibian crisis. And it was called, it was titled literally, Are We in the Midst of the Sixth Mass Extinction? And that was sort of my introduction to this concept, which was already quite uh, widely discussed in the scientific literature, and it it seemed to me, wow, you know, uh, this is something that uh, the general public ought to ought to really know more about if scientists are already uh, discussing this in the scientific literature that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. And do you think that's uh, because potentially, when we come back to the question of the amphibian um, and often and the insect populations that we're losing, that they're not the charismatic me megafauna, they're not the pandas and the whales, that that, that, are, that the majority of our species lost are, are creatures that we potentially um, don't think about when we think about saving a particular kind of animal. Well, I, I certainly think a lot of creatures suffer from, you know, bad PR, <laughs> and amphibians are, are probably way up there. I mean, frogs um, and toads are among some of the most spectacularly beautiful and ancient uh, lineages in, in, in the world, in my view. And, and if you go out into, if you're fortunate enough to go, say, out into the rainforest of the Neotropics and see some of these amazingly colorful, often very poisonous frogs, um, I think you'd agree. Um, so they maybe suffer from sort of being, you know, creepy crawly. But the fact is, and this is something that Australians are probably more keenly aware of than any other people, is, you know, mammals are in terrible trouble. So it's not mm. just, you know, creepy crawly things. Mm. It's our closest, very, very closest relatives, the great apes. Uh, are in enormous trouble. They are all, all of the species of great apes are very, you know, our very closest relatives that survive uh, are all in terrible, terrible trouble. So I don't think that we have to go, you know, as far, you know, down, we usually call it down the evolutionary scale, which is, you know, completely the wrong uh, metaphor to use. Uh, we can just look at our own, own closest relatives. So John, as an agricultural scientist, um, how did you respond uh, to the book when you first read it? Well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and if you haven't read it, I really think it'd be lovely if you would, because it's, it's a story of good science, but it's woven through a personal experience and encounter with some of our leading scientific thinkers around the world, including some Australians, and it's woven in a way that it tells, a, and it untangles the science and puts a human face on the people and the issues that we face. So as an agricultural scientist, it, it's, it was absolutely a, a wonderful read, uh, it, both beautiful and wonderful, but also really worrying and, and very worrying. And uh, we want to talk a bit more about that. So you see, why would I say that as an agricultural scientist? Well, agriculture is the biggest footprint we put on this planet. The food you eat and the food I eat has more profound impact on the nature of the functioning of this planet than anything else pretty much we do. And that's why I feel it's a vitally important read in that it puts the big issues on the table in a most imaginative and exciting way. Read it. 
<laughs> well, that's a solid endorsement. And Elizabeth's book will be available for sale in the festival bookshop after this session. Um, but it, <laughs> well, I, I say that because it's so hard, and one of the problems we face in Australia at the moment, that we haven't been that successful as scientists making science exciting and understanding what's happening with climate change in a way that engages and excites us with finding solutions. We haven't done that well. This book does. And I guess that's the big question about when people talk about the loss of biodiversity. It sounds very much like a phrase and it doesn't really have a real connection and a real meaning. So, so in, in a sense, I think, um, what were the struggles in your book in terms of how you communicate not just what the problem is, but why we should care about it? Yeah, well, that that is a biggie. Um, and I've, I've often been asked that, I mean, point blank on, you know, national TV. And it's an awkward moment when, when someone says, why, why should we care? You know, and they really don't seem to care. <laughs> um, and and I, the answer that I, I, I usually give, and I'm going to give give today, although this is a more intimate setting, is is really twofold. And, 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 and one is... You know, this is the really the beauty and diversity, and I guess you could say functioning of, of our planet. It took tens of millions of years for diversity to reach uh, the level that it has now, um, the world as we recognize it, and and we are unraveling that really, really fast. That if if there's no nothing else that I want would like you to leave this session with today, it is the speed uh, with which. This event is, is occurring. It, it's in human time. It may seem slow, you know, your your one lifetime, uh, but in geological time, in the time of in terms of life on this planet, which goes back some three billion years, it's it's virtually instantaneous. It will show up in the fossil record as a very very rapid event, uh, not unlike an asteroid impact. Um, and if we don't care about that, uh, then I guess the question is, you know, what would we care about? <laughs> But if you want to just bring it right home and say, okay, in your own life, you know, how is this going to affect you know, me and my kids and my grandkids? Um, I think that the question, I can't tell you exactly how it's going to happen, but one of the geologists that I, or paleontologists, I guess, that I quote in the book makes the point that at the moment of mass extinction, in these mass extinctions, the rules of the survival game seem to change. It's very difficult to predict what's going to come through a mass extinction. No one has come up with a formula and said, OK, this is what uh, kind of creature comes from mass extinction. So many organisms, whole groups of organisms, whole orders of organisms that were dominant, and I give you the example of the dinosaurs, uh, do not come through mass extinction. So if you're the dominant creature on Earth right now, and that is you know, humans, mammals, uh, you wouldn't necessarily say you're going to fare that well in a mass extinction. You might, uh, but you might not. So that would certainly be uh, something to consider. Yeah. I think Paul Elric, you quote him in the book quite accurately from my reading. And when you say not caring about the biodiversity and the diversity and the other species that we're living with on this planet is a bit like not caring that you're soaring off the branch of the tree that you're standing on. And that's what I think is exactly the problem. And it's, it's an awareness that we have uh, this issue of learning to live in a safe place in the continent, where, where meanwhile generating well-being and, and, and uh, economic development. We've got to do both and weave it together. And that's the challenge that I think you and I have to work out how to do. Yeah, and I think um, I think you've put it very well when when you describe it that that in this extinction event humans are the asteroid, you know, and that that you know the way that you describe that in, is very powerful in the terms of the impact that we're having and the scale of that impact. Um, and and I kind of wanted to ask you more, a little bit more as a non-scientist, as a journalist coming to this topic, um, if you know how how you found weaving um, and understanding the actual science of how we actually you know how we can actually show the evidence that this is actually occurring in our lifetime. Well, that, that's that's a really good question, and you know, it's um, when people look at extinction rates. I mean, it's it's not an easy thing to do because we don't know what's what's in the denominator, right? So we don't know how many species there are on Earth. Some people would say by an order of magnitude. We just don't know how many. There are millions. We don't know if there are tens of millions. You know, we we just don't have a very good sense. This sort of general you know, rough estimate right now is, say, around 8 or 10 million. Um, and so if you don't know what's at the bottom, it's very hard to know, you know, get a fraction by what's at the top. But 
one way that people, and there are many papers, increasing numbers of paper costs coming out on just this subject. One came out just very recently. It's like, okay, how can we really measure extinction rates? Um, it takes a while for a species to become extinct, to be declared extinct, even once it is uh, committed to extinction. It's in, in, inexorably going extinct. Um, and so one thing that people have done is they've looked at the rate at which um, very well-known groups of animals, right? So we have a very pretty good idea of how many mammals there are on the planet, about 5,500 species of mammals. We occasionally find a new species, but very rarely. Uh, and if you look, if you track those species and you look at the rate at which they are going, some, you know, all, there are all these categories that the IUCN has of endangerment, and you track them through you know, threatened, you know, endangered, critically endangered, extinct, uh, and you say, okay, are they a good you know, sort of stand-in for other species? And that's debatable. I, I have to confess that's debatable. But when you do that, you find extinction rates are very, very high, quite possibly as high or, or higher uh, than they were during the last mass extinction um, 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs and lots of other things. I mean, the dinosaurs get top building, but lots and lots and lots of uh, creatures went out in that last mass extinction. So those are some of the ways that people try to get around this tricky sort of mathematical question, which is what are extinction rates right now? But it's, it's fairly well established that, these, that this, this extinction event is happening, so maybe we could expand on to looking at some of those drivers um, as, to, as to what's actually driving this extinction. Obviously, humans as the asteroid, but, but in terms of the processes of, of climate change, and, um, and in your book you refer to ocean acidification as the uh, evil twin of climate change. And, and in fact, that's a story that, that brought you to Australia. Yes, about f five years ago now, I came to Australia with some scientists who are studying ocean acidification um, on the Great Barrier Reef. And I don't, is everyone familiar with the term ocean acidification? Yes, okay, so I'm not going to go through the, <laughs> the chemistry, but it's, um, it's really simple, which is just that we're pumping a lot of CO2 into the air, and a lot of it's ending up in the water just it, because there's a gas exchange with the surface of the water and the atmosphere, and, and CO2 dissolves in water to form an acid, carbonic acid, and that's as basic as that. And it turns out that a lot, a lot of creatures, and um, particularly stony corals, the corals that build coral reefs, like the Great Barrier Reef, are very sensitive to changes in ocean chemistry. Um, and so what you really get, if you talk to anyone, um, and I was out with a whole bunch of scientists who were studying uh, the reef, um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place, as you all know, um, you get these very robust predictions um, that if we continue on with dumping CO2 into the atmosphere at the rate we are now, you know, by the middle of this century, uh, the Great Barrier Reef will essentially cease to exist. It will stop being a functioning reef, and eventually it will just erode away into the ancient, you know, reefs that are all around, that we see all around us, which are, you know, just old piles of limestone. Uh, and if that is not a sobering thought, um, it's hard for me to think what, what is. Yeah, and it's important that the acidification is a terribly important driver, as you've described, but it's also the fact that the reef is exposed to, to all the uh, material sediments and pesticides right. from our, our, our use of the land on, the, on there. And of course, with our development of port facilities, we're intending to put a whole lot more. So we're putting other stresses. It's really just one stressor or effect that drives things into extinction. It's, it's usually a number of them. And in the reef, it's a beautiful example of firstly the acidification, then the rise in temperatures, then the changing water levels that will expose them to more sunlight, and then the effect that we're putting pesticides and sediments and other uh, materials on the reef. So all this adds together to put stress. And that's just one example. And I think, Elizabeth, you've got some beautiful examples of how we just add one more stressor. And the big stressor towards extinction that you do so well in your book is the fact that because of our travel commitments, the continents used to be, uh, Gondwana was together when we had the continental drift, but now we've stuck them all back together again because because we can actually travel amongst them all and spread things around. You want to talk about that? Because that, to me, is a critical driver yeah. of extinction. Yeah, and it, it's also, once again, something that's very, very, um, you know, alive to, I would think, to Australians, because it's a big, been a big driver of, of extinction here in Australia, a um, very prominent driver of extinction. And, the, and that is um, this sort of reassembling the continent. So if, if, you think, if you think that things have evolved separately for 
in some cases, in the case of Australia, you know, tens of millions of years, right, that the continent's been um, basically isolated. Mm -hmm. And then in the course of a day, uh, either through air travel or boat travel, it's, it's estimated that in the ballast of, a super tankers, of our super tankers, every single day, 10,000 species are being moved around the planet. Um, so when you think about it, you bring these lineages together that have been apart for many millions of years, and, you know, a bunch of things can happen. One is nothing. You know, the new species comes, it arrives, it drops dead, it, it can't find anything to eat. Uh, another is it comes and it, you know, it does okay, but it doesn't really cause much much damage. It just sort of muddles along. And, and another is that it comes and it does a lot of damage. It's a predator that just, you know, eats everything in sight or it crowds out native uh, species. And this third... Uh, possibility doesn't happen to have to happen all that often. If you're traveling, if tens of thousands of species are traveling around every day for very damaging effects to occur. So, you know, there are a lot, a lot of species in Australia right now that shouldn't be here, uh, that you're all aware of them, uh, and that were brought over, sometimes purposefully, sometimes not purposefully, that have caused tremendous damage and have driven your native species to extinction or to the very brink of extinction. And again, it comes back to that acceleration of scale. And that, exactly. that if this event was only a one in a thousand event, then that, that would be okay, unless we're in this situation where we're having this accelerated transfer and accelerated mixing. Right, right, exactly. And look, species did get to, you know, species have trans traveled oceanically, uh, you know, over, over in, in history, but they arrived, let's say, once every, you know, 10,000 years. <laughs> now they arrive every day. And so just everything is souped up. Um, and it's very, very hard, uh, given the speed at which evolution takes place and the speed at which, you know, global travel takes place. Those, those two are incommensurate. And that's, and that's what we're seeing. And, and for me, just conceptualizing this idea of the, um, the new Pangea, that, that where kind of globalization has, has yeah. brought us all back together, um, resonates for me having come from an infectious diseases space and that we're now seeing you know, the ability of diseases to spread right. very quickly across the world in the, in the same kind of way. Right, and we see disease vectors being moved around the world and establishing themselves um, sometimes very, very comfortably in new places. Um, so we have diseases that you know, didn't exist on one continent that now are very well established on a new continent. Yeah, you were just, um, we were talking earlier about Hawaii being an example. I didn't realize that there were no native mosquito species originally in, in Hawaii. Yeah, there were, no, there were many, many groups of, of organisms that were missing from Hawaii, and, and mosquitoes were one, and now you have avian malaria in Hawaii, and that... Um, in addition to, as, as you know, as, as we were discussing, there's a lot, often there's a lot of synergies that go into an extinction, but in the case of Hawaiian birds, which are, have been devastated uh, by forest clearing, um, by hunting, uh, and now by avian malaria. And so I, I guess now if we kind of shift maybe to, to looking at how we respond and, and adapt to, to the situation that we're they're in right now, I mean, I think that there's been some really recent research looking at the capacity of species to adapt and, and, and under these circumstances um, in terms of their genetics and, and in, in response to an evolutionary sense. I mean, what is the capacity of species adaptation to avoid extinction? Well, I think that's the question we're going to discover, and unfortunately, you know, that's a, that's the big experiment we're running uh, without knowing the answer to. So, um, you know, you could say, I guess, one answer I could say is, you know, just hang around, and we're we're going to find the answer. It's it's not necessarily how you would go about doing things uh, in a scientifically <laughs> rigorous way, but 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 that's what we're doing. Some species, I mean, when you think of it about it, just on a very very, you know rudimentary level, you'd think, well, species that, that reproduce very quickly, go through generations very quickly, they, they may do better. So insects may do better, for example, at avoiding extinction. And, and species that have long reproductive times, like large mammals, um, are going are gonna to fare poorly. And you know, when you look at the large mammals on the planet right now, they are foring, faring very poorly. Uh, so, you know, that might be a first order sort of approximation. But we do not know the answer to that question as a... <laughs> And, and John, what are your feelings on the adaptation of the human species? Well, I think that that is the uh, really uh, interesting part of um, Elizabeth's book is because she has a chapter in there about the uh, danger uh, gene that we, we might have. You see, the damage we've been talking about, and we can all end up in a gloomy scene, that there's no doubt in my mind because that we have a huge problem to address. The evidence is everywhere. Uh, scientifically. And it's even to the point that geologists have 
well defined, the Anthropocene. That is a whole new era, which is the consequence of humankind. And the way they decided that the humankind needed to have its own period in geological history for the planet was because human act, these are the four reasons, or some of them, and they're in Elizabeth's book. Human activity has transformed between a third and a half of the land surface of the planet. We've changed the, sand, the structure of the planet's vegetation and land use at least 40 by, by about 40%. And I, I think that's really obvious when you get those um, views from space. Right. Just have a look at the satellite that Chris Hatfield and all those beautiful images that are in his work. But also CSIRO produced one of the earliest ones of view from, from space, from a satellite, at night. And you just see the impact on the planet as a whole. The other thing is that the most of the world's major rivers have been dammed and diverted. Most do no longer flow to the sea, like the Colorado and sometimes our Murray system. And the human, we're using half of the available fresh water by diversion. That's a huge impact on the nature of the planet. We produce more fertiliser in our planet, in, in, in our factories, than the whole of the nitrogen that's fixed in terrestrial ecosystems. That's a profound effect and a necessary effect if we want to feed ourselves, but the consequences is really profound on the ecosystems. And we, fishing has removed more than a third of the primary production of our coastal oceans. And so the profound effect on the planet is there for all to see. The human capacity to do that is in our very genes and our human condition. But my hope and belief is that in that same human condition is the capacity to be aware of what we've done. Don't have to be necessarily ashamed of it. It's part of what we are. But we also have the ability to be aware of it. But importantly, we know scientifically how to mitigate it. We know how to live differently and change the way we live. That we're the first species I'm aware of that not only is able to adapt, many species can do that, they can be aware and can adapt, but we can also understand what is happening and the drivers that are changing the planetary function are drivers that we can actually work with to make a better world and a planet and operate in a safe place. Now the question is, if the human condition actually does that that I've said, it will break all the evolutionary Darwinian principles because we'll be responding to and mitigating the driver of the extinction. So, it's in our hands, <laughs> it's in your hands and it's in my hands. Which I find very inspiring because it can be very overwhelming when, we, when we're hit in the face with some of these statistics and these stories. So, so from some of your experiences travelling you know, to some of the most amazing places on the planet, Elizabeth, what were some of the strategies you saw that actually inspired you that there, there is potentially some science to survival that beyond extinction? Well, I, I think the point that John makes is really you know, the $64 trillion question. It's really the question of our time, you know, yeah. whether... Um, the same kind of genius, really, that brought us into this mess <laughs> and increasingly allows us to understand that we're in a pretty dire situation, or certainly at least that the other creatures with whom we share the planet are in a dire situation. Uh, whether consciousness of that uh, brings with it change of, of the sort that would alleviate it. And I you know, do not know the answer to that at all. I, when I went out to report this book, I met a lot of, of people, obviously. One unfortunately only talks to people. Um, they're, they're, uh, the animals don't really talk much. They don't have a voice in this. Um, though they talk to each other, certainly. Uh, um, apart from the voice you give them. Yeah, and that, that was definitely, you know, mm, part point. of the idea. <laughs> um, and they are, you know, a lot, a lot of people out there are working really, really hard in from everything to preserve. I mean, in, in the story, I t in the book, I tell the story of um, the last few remaining um, examples of a bird, the Hawaiian crow, mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, and people have gone to extraordinary lengths to keep this bird alive. And one of the anecdotes I tell is about um, they have this one male bird, and he's he's kind of crazy, and he doesn't really identify as a bird. He was brought up by people, and I'm sure you've heard stories that birds imprint, and and he was imprinted as a human, and he really probably thinks he's human. Uh, so he refuses to mate with any of the any of the female birds. Um, and so they have a, a woman, a PhD, reproductive physiologist, who every spring when it's mating season, uh, back in Hawaii, he's been now taken to California. Um, she sort of ministers to him in a way that um, he's supposed to find very erotic. Um, and he is supposed to deliver uh, some of his uh, semen so she can rush back to Hawaii uh, with it to try to in, uh, artificially inseminate some of these female birds to keep this bird uh, species alive, of which there are only about 100 left in the world. And um, I was there in springtime uh, last spring, not yeah, about a year and a half ago, and, and it hadn't worked so far, to be honest, but she was preparing to try again, and I really have to check back in and see what happens. So that is one example, just one example of people working to save individual species, and then there are people you know, working very hard to save vast tracts of land. I mean, I went out into the Amazon with people who have really successfully worked their whole career and gotten a lot, you know, big chunks of the Amazon now are protected, though big chunks are also very, very much in danger right now. Um, so people are working at all sorts of levels from the very, uh, you know, directed and species directed to the whole sort of ecosystem directed. Um, and there are certainly obviously many, many people trying to work on mitigating climate change, though Lord knows that's not going so well. Um, Why isn't it going so well? Well, I mean, I think that the headlines in the Australian papers today suggest why it's not going so well. <laughs> I mean, it's just a big transition from an economy, a global economy based on fossil fuels, to a global economy not based on fossil fuels. And if you thought to yourself, what's a hard nut to crack, that, that would be it. That would be the hard nut to crack. But it, but it really has to be done. It's going to have to be done at some point. People make the point, you know, fossil fuels are, are a very large resource, but they're not an infinite resource. And if we burn through everything that we can, uh, we are going to be in really, really dire straits. I mean, the life as we know it will, will really not be possible. <laughs> um, so we really need to show some self-discipline here and keep a lot of what we know is out there uh, in the ground. Uh, and that gets back to the point that John was making. You know, do we have it in ourselves? Uh, does awareness uh, mean anything to us? Or are we just going to sort of run uh, headlong into what we know or should know is a really, really dangerous situation? And I guess it comes back again to that question of scale. A, a lot of these problems is that we feel that this is a, a large, enormous global problem and that personally each of us don't feel how we can be a part of that solution. So I, how have you personally responded in, after writing this book to, to some of those issues? Well, I think that everyone, you know, and this has a kind of a mystical um, sense, and I don't, I am not a mystical person, <laughs> but I, I heard, I, I don't know if people here have heard of Sylvia Earle. She's a very famous American oceanographer. She spent a lot of time underwater living in these places that you couldn't get me to, to go if you paid me a lot, a lot of money, um, but literally living for days and days underwater. And I, I, she has a, a new documentary out about the oceans and the terrible threat that they're under for, as John mentioned, not just ocean acidification, but a whole host of reasons. And she, I was listening to her on the radio the other day, and I thought she made a really good point. And she was really especially aiming it at young people. And she said, look, everyone, everyone has the ability to do something. You have to look in, inside yourself and at what your talents are uh, and what you can bring um, to bear to being, trying to be, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Um, and I think that that's good advice. You know, everyone, I can't say to you, you should do X or Y because, you know, I just don't know what your, your life is like or your talents are, but I do think it's true that everyone um, can do something. Uh, can participate in some way um, in trying to move this uh, conversation forward. And even if the conversation seems like a f small and weak first step, um, it's what's got to happen. Our politics have to change. A lot of things have to change. None of us in this room is going to alter the global economy on our own. I mean, that is clearly true. 
And, and John, taking one step up from that, um, <coughs> apart from individuals as a nation, where do you see Australia's... I mean, we have this argument on a national level that Australia is a small population base and that we only represent such a minority that we can never make a difference. I mean, I mean how do you yeah. respond to those well, kinds I of Well, I think that's absolute nonsense. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, it's, so it's so what, what should Australia be doing? Well, Australia pioneered a lot of water reforms in the last 10 to 15 years where we actually were the first country to put water back into a river system and uh, learning how to price water appropriately and, and mm. trade it and, and that we got through the drought largely because in 2004 we decided that you could trade mm. water from low level, low value use to high value use and we did that through the drought. Now agricultural productivity did not suffer through that drought. And, and just do you think that's because we sense the urgency? Well, we finally we did in sensed 2000. the urgency? I think we have windows of opportunity when culturally uh, we, we knew we went through a lot of the stuff that we've just been talking about around 2000. You can see I'm old and I've heard these debates for a long time. Around 2000, there was an awareness of the need to do things and up to about 2007, 2008, there was a huge in energy to do something about the problems. But when we actually saw what we had to do, which was that we had to get off fossil fuels, we had to actually have some vegetation planning so we didn't destroy any more habitat. We had to take less water out of the river systems. Those who were in the powers that were benefiting by the current system could see that they would be losers in a future that was not fossil fuel, that was not highly exploitive, have spent a lot of time creating doubt and uncertainty amongst us as Australians, so that when we arrived there, and the dividing point was when I believe Kevin Rudd walked from doing anything about climate change, that was a turning point. It's hard, we can't do it. But I want to leave you with the message that we can do it, it's scientifically and technically very possible to change, but the change will have to be done by ourselves. Let's give examples of where we've have managed to do it. Melbourne actually reduced the water consumption per head by conservation, not by any forceful implement, but by willingness to save water and dropped it from something like 320 litres per day per person to around 180. And, and there, it sits and, and around 200. there was that 200. sense of community around that There was that a commensal community, people self-policed. Yep. A whole lot of wonderful things happened. That's in Melbourne because I'm talking to mainly a Melbourne crowd. But I saw the same thing happen in Sydney. We happened and it happened in Brisbane. The other thing is, why have we got a problem with electricity generation surplus? Because Australians realise we can save energy. We don't have to burn so much. And we are using a lot less energy per head than we ever have. Hence the crisis with super generation and the problem we have today of the actual uh, renewable energy target. So there's evidence there in our, in our very, that we can change. It, we can change how we use resources. It's interesting. We're actually asking for an extinction event. In a sense, we're asking for the extinction of fossil fuels. And, and like other extinction events before us, it creates a new environment in which different, different players are actually going to be more or less advantaged. And, and what you've just described then, if we're asking for an extinction event of fossil fuels, is that that will create such a new landscape socially and politically and economically that we, we fear um, and, and who is going to be more positioned in, in that post extinction yeah. environment. Well, I don't think we have to sort of feel that we've got to abandon uh, I know, I, know. I, was just, I was drawing the analogy. development <laughs> and well-being. You see, good economics, as you all know, means that the real costs of production need to be internalised in that economy. And our economy does not do that. We do not cost the real costs of much of what we produce. We throw it into the environment that then subsidises it. When we actually pay for the price of emitting carbon into the air, we're starting to internalise the real costs of our economy. We've only, if we can make the carbon economy be eternalised and then do that with other things, if you can throw your waste into the common space with no cost to you, that's not good economics. And I think with good economics and really good thinking, we're in good place to build a new economy that's every bit as generative of well-being as our current one and better and retains the environment in a safe operating space. 
And again, I think it's about changing that narrative that we've had that it's either one or the other, that it's environment right. versus progress. And that, you know, and that anyone who stands up for the environment says, well, you're, you don't want, you know, development. And, and I guess, you know, are we seeing more breaking down of that, that narrative of, of it being a clash? And, and Elizabeth, do you, do you feel that maybe there's some potential for those stories to be woven together? Well, I, I mean, I'm an, obviously an outsider to Australian politics, but, but at, from an outsider's perspective, it seems to me that, that Australians are, are extremely well positioned to show the rest of the world um, how, to, how to do this. Um, you have a lot of, of resources of all sorts, not just uh, fossil fuels, although fortunately or unfortunately you have a lot of those. A square inch of sunshine <laughs> rate is probably exactly. quite high. Exactly. And you're a, a, a nation and also a continent and also an island. So you really can keep track of, of exactly you know what, what, what's going on here, what inputs are coming in and what, what outputs are going out. Uh, in a way that's 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 much tougher in in a lot of other places. So, you know, I I think, and as I say, I'm someone who watched Australian politics from from afar. But when Australia put in in a carbon tax as a very rich, advanced, industrialized nation, that was a sort of a beacon. And when you repealed it, uh, that was a very crushing uh, a blow. And so, what happens now as 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 we go forward? Um, I think Australia has has a big role to play. Unfortunately, it's not n- always a happy uh, thing to have that kind of responsibility. But um, as a, a as a nation that could profit greatly, you know, from just digging up all its coal and 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 throwing it into the atmosphere, uh, if Australia Australians uh, were to make the um, statement that they don't want to do that, uh, that they don't want to destroy the Great Barrier Reef, because that is an inevitable uh, uh, result of what we're doing, um, that that would have a very powerful effect. And so some of those drivers really are about um, uh, social and community will and about having good leadership. Yeah, I think Elizabeth's point's well made. I was recently in Oxford and uh, the chief scientist, uh, John Beddington, leaned across the table to me uh, at a restaurant and said, John, you Australians actually led the world in, in water reform mm-hmm. uh, and, we, we, and it's been picked up by California and lots of places. And, we, and then they said, that's what we, we admire about Australia is that you're, you're in a position that you can do these things. Now, you did that, but you seem to be retracting on water reform. And then he said a very important thing to me. He said, John, doesn't it work? You see, by taking that leadership role and then retreating, as we seem to be today, Australia is having a very damaging influence on the global community. We think we don't matter and we are a small nation, but we're a very fortunate nation who can take leadership. And if you look at history, it's the redeeming small minorities who take the moves that change the world. We can do it, and we can get benefit from doing it. It's within our genes to do it if we so choose. And as I look around the room, I see a lot of nodding in the audience. (laughs) Um, I feel that we are very much uh, potentially all in agreement here. So how do we get that message beyond this room of people who, who, for which there is potentially quite a a strong consensus for action? Uh, How do we stop preaching to the converted? And how do we start actually better communicating and engaging with the people who are going to help us make those decisions? Elizabeth. (laughs) Um, You know, that's another that's another uh, sort of question that's sort of above my pay grade, to be honest. I mean, (laughs) one, you know, one answer I could give is, okay, well, that's why I wrote a book and that's why I wrote it the way I did to hopefully get people not just, as you say, sort of preaching to the choir. I don't I I don't you know, I don't know who's read the book, so I can't I can't tell you if that worked at all. Um, but it also, I think, gets back to this question of, I mean, look, there's a couple of things people can obviously show by example. You know, if, if people, I think that that's very powerful. Anyone, you know, doing anything, anyone, you know, the person who puts up solar panels on their house um, probably leads to other people doing so in their neighborhood, and that has a, can have a big ripple effect. So I think just actions that you take in your individual life may have, um, effects beyond which you can even be aware. Um, and the other thing is by, you know, simply 
making it a focus, you know, it, it sort of gets back to the point about what, where, where are your talents and what, what, what can you do, um, and, and, and using those talents for, for this purpose. Um, I can't give a, a, a prescription for how we're going to extend this conversation. I do see it being extended, and I think that, you know, more and more people, certainly this is true in the States, are very conscious of what's going on. Now that, you could say, leads to more and more of a pushback from some very powerful economic interests that are at stake here. Um, and that battle is going to have to be fought, and it's going to have to be, you know, either won or lost. And I think that the point is we have to take a view that goes beyond, you know, tomorrow and the next day. Uh, we have to be a, a bit more forward-looking. You know, we are, we are looking, at, just to bring this back home, at the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef within 50 years, okay? Now, many of us will not be here in 50 years. I, I do not plan, unfortunately, I do not expect to be here in 50 years, but I hope my kids will be here in 50 years. And if we can't take that kind of a view of things, then I, I really don't, I don't see any hope for us. <laughs> um, but we have to, uh, we have to try. There's going to be an opportunity to ask some questions um, uh, in, a, in a few moments. Um, and just before we do, I just want to ask, John, um, if, if we are fighting ec economic interests, um, should we be fighting fire with fire? And what is the, you know, the economic argument? Well, I think that's right. And I, I think in the Wentworth Group, we certainly believe that one of the most important things is that we need to have uh, a market for markets developed that actually recognise uh, the carbon market but and also other means that um, recognise that we need an economy that internalises the costs of that economy. Because we get so many benefits for free. Yeah, that's right. And, 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 and not only that, if we just did that on many things, uh, we made a decision not to reduce our biodiversity anymore as Australians. You can, you can do that by lots of ways. So people who are conserving biodiversity receive a stewardship payment for those services they maintain beyond their duty of care. Wentworth is, is, is trying to put some of this material before government and will continue to press for that. So there are ways that do it, I think, driving on good economics. We are not about development and environment. We're about weaving together a place where we can have well-being and we can have operating in a safe place. And one of the big ones that Australians have to come to terms with is planning and land use planning. Because we spread everywhere like treacle. <laughs> we destroy far more, and yet we have, we're a small area the where we all want to live. We all want to live on a little ribbon up the east coast and a little bit dash in, in the west coast. That means if we're going to accommodate another 15 million people by 2050, which is maybe 30 million, well, by world standards, it's a small number of people, but on a narrow strip of 50 kilometres from the coast, mm. with, if we want to maintain the amenity and the beauty and the function that's in our landscape, we better plan it. We can't just expect it to happen. So planning is one thing that I would argue strongly for and land use planning. Let's take some questions from the audience. Let's start down the front. We've got some microphones, if you just wouldn't mind waiting. We'll have one question here and we'll have a follow-up question here. Just moving back slightly, you said that when you were in England, um, we are seen as retreating from our water reform. Mm. Now, why is that? And in what way are we doing that? OK, it's Thank we'll you. be quick about it. Well, this current government has, has abolished the Water Commission it has moved away from any COAG agreement process to manage water nationally, and it's retreated away from de determining that all decisions will go back to one-stop shop states. All of that allow the water reform agenda and the National Water Initiative to largely be wound back. So uh, that's local think, politics. Uh, <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, and again, I think it's something that people are, are not aware of what's not happening. We, we see what is happening, but potentially the things that, are, that used to happen that no longer happen now don't actually get a lot of airplay in our media. Um, sorry. Yes, please. Um, do you think voting and campaigning for the Greens in the state election, for example, could be one form of action? <laughs> Well, I, I don't mind declaring my rule. At the moment, the, the, the Greens certainly are putting the, the facts on the table that are bound on good science. This is in terms of the environment. And I think you have to put your vote where the science tells you should be. And that's where mine is. It's interesting if you have a look at the number of parliamentarians who have uh, science backgrounds or science training. 
And if you look across the number of our, our parliamentarians in the federal parliament to see who has science qualifications, um, the party that actually has the most people, particularly, especially by a percentage, is actually the Greens. The interesting thing I would say that I, I would have thought that looking after the environment, looking after the branch that you're standing on, would be a conservative position. <laughs> An interesting perspective. We have a question up the back and then we'll have one question down here in the middle of the centre. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for a very interesting uh, conversation. Um, something that is always striking in these conversations is that the facts through science are irrefutable, the contest is economic, and then it's resolved or otherwise through in the political sphere. Hmm. And so I guess a really tough question, which kind of flows from what you just said, is what role do scientists and those that support them need to play in the political sphere? What is possible? It's very difficult because, you know, you can be painted as partisan for one side or another when, in fact, science is about being, you know, very much focused on facts and not adhering to a political position. But I guess my question is, given the situation that we're in, is that good enough and is there an alternative for how science can play a role or participate directly in political debates, because that's the, that's the question that we're facing now. Maybe, Elizabeth, you would, could you give us some examples um, from... I think it's a really hard question. I have talked to a lot of um, American scientists, and I, I'm going to infer that the situation in Australia is quite similar, who are pretty uncomfortable. You know, they, they'd much rather, you know, write this paper that appears in, you know, nature or science, or maybe it appears in something much more obscure, and I said what I needed to say, and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And that, you know, we see that all the way up to something like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You know, we, we say things, we say it in a language that most people find, you know, snoozeworthy, and they hit the snooze button, and, you know, they go on. Um, and it's very hard. Uh, and then when you take a, a more sort of active... Um, he did, you know, sort of colorful position. You are maybe ostracized by your fellow scientists who say you're not really, that's not science, that's opinion, that's rhetoric, blah, blah, blah. And I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I think, um, you know, we have in the States occasionally had actual scientists in political office. And I think, you know, maybe we need more people actually, you know, r r running for office. Um, and to separate out those, you know, those fears, I think you, you, did a good job in presenting this sort of flow chart here, and it's a very it's very frustrating as a, as a journalist to see, um, and, you know, not even a scientist. You know, I try to translate what the scientists are saying, and then it also has no real impact on the political process, which is dominated, you know, not to be too much of a kind of cynic here, but dominated by big big money, especially in the states right now, just huge amounts of money that you can't even believe. <laughs> Um, and they're not going, I can tell you, to make you know a new uh, solar-based economy. Um, so I don't think anyone knows how to break that logjam. I think that um, you know many scientists, and there are many, many groups, increasingly, at least in the states, groups of scientists coming together to try to figure out how can we communicate better. Um, Does it come back, though, to what you were saying earlier about your talents and recognising what your talents are? In some ways, I feel sometimes it's a bit unfair that we say to scientists, you're a great scientist and that's your talent, and we ask you to do that. But then we also ask you to do things for which you aren't trained or skilled at, right. at doing. And I think in some ways you have to consider, again, the best use of, of your talent as a scientist is doing research. Um, um, and then what the role is then for people like yourself, for journalists, or even for informed people in society to be able to hold um, informed evidence-based opinion but not be a scientist. Yes, and I think a lot of scientists do take that position. Look, this is what I do, communication. You know, if I'd wanted to be, you know, a writer or a rhetorician, I would have done that. Um, but I also do think people are feeling increasingly, given what the stakes are, you know, we're not talking about... Uh, you know, the weight of a muon or whatever, which doesn't really, you know, affect uh, the future of the whole planet, what, you know, what exactly that weight is. Um, it just works the universe together. <laughs> it's an important one. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think that increasingly people do feel just because they're people and they're worried about their kids and they're worried about the future of the planet that they do have to, that there is an ethical component here um, and that it's probably not enough anymore to put out your scientific paper and hope for the best. And another thing I'd like to raise as a journalist, just to make things more depressing, 
um, is that the press is in terrible shape. I mean, you know, newspapers are going under, uh, magazines are going under, even TV, you know, you thought, well, things can't get worse. TV news is cutting back. So where are people going to get their information, even if, they, you know, even if the scientists are putting it out and the journalists are doing their best to translate it, which, you know, we won't comment on the quality of all that, but it just, it just you know, there's just this sort of, you know, celebrity news. Soon we're just going to get, you know, only Miley Cyrus news. And um, it's it's not a good situation at a, uh, for for informa- getting information at a moment when information is really crucial. Um, well, your, your colleague, Tim Flannery, is part of the concern, uh, the Wentworth uh, group, group for Concerned yeah. Scientists. And, and he's one scientist who has stuck his head above the parapet, so to speak, yeah. to varying success. Should scientists be more engaged well, in the public debate? I firstly say that I think, as uh, Elizabeth said and you said, that there's, there's horses for courses. Some scientists uh, are really the last thing you'd want to do is expose them to the public. <laughs> they um, do spend a lot of time but in, I, I in dark I was the chief of a, a major CSIRO division. And there are some scientists who actually can communicate their work very well to the public and others who do the other job. So don't force everybody into the same shoe. But we in the Wentworth Group feel there's an absolute central place. And Peter Cullen, in writing Speaking Truth to Power, one of his lovely papers, it's a, that, so, that some scientists coming together and learning how to write science to influence evidence-based science to influence policy that's where I, I feel my passion is. Now, it's all part, you've got to be bipartisan, sure. At the moment, it looks as though one party is more likely to speak to the science than others. But the times change. So our objective in Wentworth is to put the science in formats and use it to influence politicians as much as you can, but make sure it's based on well-researched and properly peer-reviewed science. So I think there are a very important role, and the Wentworth Group has been one like that, and we're in the process of trying to set up an international network of scientists, not not an IPCC, but just the science, and learning how to write science that speaks to policy and power is, I think, an important issue for some scientists. We had a question just here in the audience. Is it, is it, oh, yeah, one there, and then we'll have the gentleman behind you. In fact, you have already uh, well dealt with one of the things I wanted to touch on, which is a lack of scientific communication, I guess, mm. but I was mostly thinking about schools mm. because I think it's important to harness the enthusiasm of young people before they've gone too jaded. And uh, I think <laughs> scientific, communica- uh, scientific teaching in Australia is not great. And I think that maybe there is a need for more of that kind of involvement from scientists into uh, school. I would agree wholeheartedly. Into school. Yeah. And I was wondering how it is in the States, for instance. Is better, yeah, is it it's it, the states better. are a big place, as you know, and I wouldn't want to. But I think in general, there's a, it's pretty dismal at a high school level. I mean, we we still are having arguments in some states, which will remain nameless, about you know whether you should be teaching evolution. Okay, <laughs> so you can't really get better than that. Um, and so I think I think that. You know, we periodically in the states, you know, ever since Sputnik, have had these, you know, crises, and I think we are having one of those now too. Are we really producing enough scientists? And part of that is is scientific education at a grade school, high school level good enough? And I, I would think the general consensus is no. I know Australia is in a situation where um, the large percentage of maths and science teachers actually haven't had maths and science training, that too many teachers yeah. are having to teach out of discipline um, yeah. and that, that you're asking people who have no coalface hands on human stories of science to share with their students. Um, we have uh, a question just behind. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, a couple of things I've been worried about. You, I've read that uh, the um, seas might be to eat. We might have nothing other than jellyfish, and uh, I've read that, that the bees might all stop pollinating. Now I don't know the time frame or the probabilities. Perhaps Elizabeth could help. Could someone help? Well, I think those are, um, you know, uh, they're 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 good. They're good storyline, and there's there's an element in truth in both of them. I mean, I think that um, jellyfish are a really interesting question. There seem to be once again, this is hard to 
measure because we don't really have a lot of good data on populations of sea creatures. The seas are, you know, sort of another country, as they say. Um, Almost another planet. Exactly. We, we really, you know, really, really don't know what's in the oceans. But there seem, anecdotally, there seem to be a lot more jellyfish blooms now. And uh, one theory, which I've heard voiced by very Ed educated people, so this isn't just like, you know, kind of a good story, is that jellyfish will be beneficiaries of a shortened food chain. So we will, you know, um, be doing in a lot of marine vertebrates, uh, and we will be at the benefit of, of things like jellyfish, which will which will thrive. That's a, that's a possibility. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. So, uh, but it's not, it's not a science fiction-y sort of possibility. It's a genuine possibility. <laughs> Uh, and pollination is a really huge one. It's a huge one. Um, I don't know what's happening here in Australia. In the U.S., we, we have are having... killer bees, don't we? Uh, killer bees. Do you have African killer bees here? Not John? many. No, no, not many. We, we, but we have... Uh, it's well documented in the U.S. and even in Australian agricultural areas. We have to introduce bees um, and have beehives in our, in our orchards in, say, Hilston to produce your almonds. Uh, there's not sufficient uh, uh, introduced bee to actually do the pollination. So pollination is a serious problem. There's no doubt about it. And some of the bee diseases that we have around the world are eliminating the bee. And the species of bee that seems to overcome those diseases is a dominant one that's not necessarily a pollinating bee. Mm. So it's a serious problem and there's a lot of data to support the concern. We're drawing our session to a close now, but I would, I would very much encourage you um, to... Uh, if you haven't already read it, to take a read of um, Elizabeth's book, because I think really it, um, it it draws on the themes that we've really come to right now, that, um, that the solutions are necessarily going to be, they're going to be scientific ones, but to actually ensure they happen will require human stories and human narrative. And I think that this book really encaptures um, putting a human face on some of the scientific problems that we have. And so Elizabeth will be available to sign books and to speak with you um, at, the, uh, at the festival bookshop. And I'm sure John will also be around if people want to continue to um, ask questions. And I would thank the Melbourne Rhinus Festival for sponsoring this session and again to help promote some of the stories of science and to celebrate Australia's scientific achievements and, and our talent and our, and our, and our challenges. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>